Good morning. I'm Melanie Eigelhart Hammond, Sankofa Scholar, and I stand before you this morning to introduce to you our distinguished guest. I invite you to go to the Oblate School of Theology website and you may view his full biography there. Some excerpts I will share with you today. Ronald D. Harbor is one of the preeminent African-American Catholic liturgists and musicians in the United States today. A gifted pianist and composer, he is also a much sought after workshop facilitator, speaker, and liturgist. His name is recognized in, in, in association with past African-American leadership in the church. He studied at Furman University, Howard University, the Catholic University of America, the Catholic Theolo Theological Union at Georgetown University, and the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, where he earned his master's in theological studies. Among the many varied activities and positions that he has held in the church around the country include director of the Office of Worship, pastor associate liturgical musician and liturgist, adjunct professor at the Franciscan School of Theology, as the director of music and liturgy, and also as an instructor in performing arts and composer. Now, he lives in Maryland and he is presently working on another collection of Psalms for the church year. And he is presently director of the gospel choir at Our Lady of Perpetual Help, music and liturgy director at Whitefriars Hall Carmelite Seminary Formation, both in Washington, DC and he is ever searching for new ventures, and he still travels seeking and serving God's holy people. And we are so proud today that the Sankofa Institute for African American Pastoral Leadership can qualify as one of his new ventures. <laughs> and so on behalf of the Oblate School of Theology and the Sankofa Institute for Af Af African American Pastoral Leadership, we'd like for you to welcome our distinguished guest to share with us regarding black Catholic liturgical music, Mr. Ronald Harbour. And I say a good morning to you. It is ever so wonderful to be in the presence of God's holy people. Holy because God loves us. Holy because God wants the best for us. Holy because we struggle to be the best that we can be. We don't always make it. But as I was telling Sister Addie last evening, I have an adage about uh, excellence. I learned a new word. Uh, it is benevolent excellence. And it means this, that you can make an A with 97. You still have three small degrees of human imperfection. <laughs> and I am so happy uh, that uh, this, this is uh, true. Uh, but the holy people of God are those who take care of others, uh, uh, whose uh, lives uh, are based upon and founded upon the rock of our salvation, as the psalm tells us as well, and who owns everything in the world, who looks uh, down to us, but not because we are lower than any other creatures, because God is looming over us. And we're so very happy that this is the experience. Um, many people uh, can feel that African American uh, music uh, came out of nowhere. It just appeared. Um, uh, and they feel that the liturgy was always with us, though some of us can remember pre-Vatican II liturgies where you only had a set of readings for the entire year. You would use those readings every Sunday, every season, every day as well. And thank God the church saw fit 
to change its ways so that the holy people of God could get a, an ample table of scripture and, and they separated things into uh, cycles uh, as well. So we don't hear the same readings uh, every, uh, every Sunday. When we go to the next year, we have a different set of readings, some the same, but most uh, very different. And we are, it is now predicated upon, those readings are now predicated and stand on uh, d the different gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, with John being our supplement. And I say all that because I am who I am. And I, you talk about liturgy and you talk about music. All of this has to come out because the person who works in liturgy should be aware of music. And the person who is in music should be aware of liturgy. I want to uh, begin today with where the music uh, may have come from. We can only surmise that it has come from a uh, wonderfully vital, vigorous people who had their own mores and mores and who had their own sense of who God was. And they, they um, struggled toward the highest of celebrations in the name of God. Perhaps they didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as a name, but they knew God as well. And God, as I was saying before, loomed over them and was present in their everyday life, in the trees, in the ground, in the birds of the air, the fish of the sea as well. And it continued until this day. So when they were taken or stripped from their homeland and placed in a place foreign to everything that they knew and in many ways could not speak to one another because it was made sure, they made sure, uh, the Soleil masters made sure that those who spoke the same language were not part of the same group that were sent off, but they found ways. And Sister Thea Bowman, who is an august member of the holy heavenly angels at this point uh, in our lives, um, wrote something about this very thing, where it may have come from. Today, we are going to um, hear history we're going to listen to about culture, but we're also going to sing our way through the years as well. So be with us as we go through this. And if you want to ask a question about something that I've said, by all means, ask. Just raise your hand so I can recognize it and ask because all questions can be uh, a part of the fodder of your life and answers can feed you quite well. Sister Thea Bowman, who was a Franciscan sister, something's not moving. Yes, um. Oh, ah, upside down. <laughs> Part of that 3%, huh? <laughs> ah. Now, there she is, uh, a wonderful person. Please uh, Google her so you can know who she is. Please Google her. Don't allow this to be the only time that you hear her name. But she's saying that uh, African Americans preserved the memory of African religious rites and symbols. And uh, many times when people go into an African American uh, church, what they're finding is a sense of holy chaos that if you are not part of that experience, you will look at it as confusion. Uh, even, or perhaps uh, it's too loose 
for you as a very structured uh, person if you are coming from your own church. You are used to praising God in a certain way and then so are they as well. Stay around it long enough and you begin to see the genius uh, within it. And it is an, a holistic African spirituality of rhythms and of tones and harmonies that communicated their deepest feelings across barriers of, uh, or re of regions, of language, of the different cultures that were, that were mixed together as, as well. Sister Thea, uh, ah, here she begins to talk about the, uh, the occasions when people uh, came together. Uh, what you may not have known is that, uh, as you read this, you may not have known that there were times when uh, those, uh, our ancestors could slip away into what they call the hush harbors or hush arbors uh, as well. And that, uh, they would praise God and talk about, commune together about the hardships and the labors which they had gone through and they were revived. Uh, Father Clarence Rivers often spoke about how the, these, uh, our ancestors went into these hush harbors bent down, but when they came out they were standing tall because they had been fortified by community by culture, by God, and purpose as well. It's a good and, and wonderful thing. And later on, there were revivals, and there were camp meetings, and there were uh, churches in which they strengthened their sense of sacred song. There were moans and chants and psalms and hymns and jubilees the first African songs that they, they would sing or they sang African songs first and then African-American uh, songs as well. But out of those moans and chants and shouts and hymns and jubilees came the music that we have presently today. About uh, 15 years ago, I composed a piece of music that I thought captured the moans and the chants and the shouts. Uh, you may not hear shouts within this piece that we're going to sing, but you will hear the moan and you will hear the chant uh, as well. But I didn't want to compose a piece of music that would sit outside my liturgical experience. It had to be part of the liturgical experience. And so I wrote this piece thinking of moans and chants and the Negro spirituals um, and placed it in our Holy Mass. You will notice the language, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. I'm going to sing it first, and then I want you to come in and sing it as well, because magically it's on the screen. <laughs> And 
I'm going to change keys. Because it's too high for me this morning. You sing with me. Go. Here we at Lazar. Here we starts low and moan and keeps going up into chant and keeps going up into shout. It lays on Kyrie, lays on. And of course, that means, Lord have mercy. How many are Catholic here? And how many, uh, I, I welcome you and uh, understanding, and I will make sure that those who are non-Catholic understand the language and what we're doing uh, as well. Can you imagine that piece? In the liturgical experience of Lent, on the first Sunday of Lent, imagine this. You see a host of people, a host being three, a cross, a deacon, a priest, and they come, start coming from the sacristy, not down the middle aisle. This is the first Sunday of Lent. It should be starkly different from any Sunday that we have celebrated. We just celebrated Christ the King. No, we just celebrated the, um, uh, what did we celebrate at that time? Say that again. What do we celebrate just before the first Sunday of Lent? Ordinary time. And in many cases, uh, thank you for letting me know that. That, that. That's also a technique as well. Do you know where you are in the liturgical year? And in many cases, I say this because there has been so much going on in the life of an African-American church, uh, especially during February, because we've been, we've been singing all kinds of wonderful music and there, there are also celebrations of uh, African-American history month as well. It's very, very, very high toned, very, very celebratory. And in my church uh, out in um, Oakland, uh, we had on the last Sunday of Ordinary Time, we had a huge choir of a, at least 80 people from all over the diocese. They would come to St. Columba and we would have just a praise, thank you, Jesus, good time. But the next Sunday, here comes no colorful cloth. The church is stark. Out comes those people, and the holy people of God are singing. The priest and deacon come. The acolyte stands right behind them, and they bow. A profound bow. A profound bow is not two seconds. A profound bow is at least 10 seconds. At least 10 seconds. You stay there for a while. 10 seconds in the liturgical en environment is indeed very long. 
and once they finish they go to their seats and uh, we are still singing Kyrie eleison and we sing Christe Christe eleison Christe eleison they're now at their places and the congregation continues singing along with the liturgical ministers as well the president of the community and the holy people of God have a bodily movement they are signing themselves with the cross they are signing themselves at their own pace at their own pace some do this, some do this. And they do this as many as 10 to 20 times during this whole uh, song. And we go back to Kyrie, last time, Eleison, Kyrie. We don't like to let things go. Eleison, Eleison, Eleison. And there is silence before hearing, let us pray or in the case of uh, the text for the uh, priest at St. Columba was, let us continue to pray because we've already begun. And it can be an awesome experience, especially of that first Sunday of Lent. Could you hear the chant? Could you hear the moan? Could you hear the shout uh, as well? And if we knew it better um, and were able to absorb it even more, if we sang it several other times, I'm sure that you would be moved to do the sign of the cross as well. So it's mind, body, and spirit. The holy people of God who were our bishops, wrote a wonderful book called What We Have Seen and Heard. And this was written on the feast of uh, St. Peter Claver, uh, September 9th, which also just happens to be the birth date of Father Clarence Joseph Rivers. And we will speak about him uh, as time, uh, as our time goes on this morning. They wrote uh, something that was called um, "What We Have Seen and Heard," and in this, the text is from First John, one, verse three. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And they gave to us the wonderful gifts, the contemplative spirit, that prayer is spontaneous, that prayer can be found uh, anywhere that every place that we find ourselves in is a place of prayer. The sense of God's presence is profound, as taught by our ancestors. And we are to allow this to wash over us, to let go and lean on God, they said. That was a very profound statement for African-American bishops at that time. And our spiritual uh, heritage has never let us forget that God takes care of each of us and takes us by the hand and leads us in ways 
we might not understand. And that's where the title of the first African-American hymnal came from, Lead Me, Guide Me. I remember that I was, uh, I was in New Orleans at the Institute for Black Catholic Studies, and I had to run out and get something for the liturgy. And I'm going out into the hinterlands of New Orleans, not knowing where I'm going. And if you've ever been there and driven around, if you don't know the city, it's quite confusing. So I, I was uh, driving around trying to find this place, and there was a song that came on the radio. I had not heard that song since I was a child in Greenville, South Carolina. And I had to pull over because this was a moment. Um, I might sing it for you and uh, maybe I won't. But nonetheless, you, uh, um, it was just a wonderful time. I had church right there in the car. It was a good and wonderful spirit everywhere you can have uh, you can have a moment in the grocery store a moment in the in the classroom a moment in church even uh, one would think and it is also uh, not only contemplative and God's presence is everywhere it is also holistic and I uh, they say like the biblical t t tradition, there is no dualism, uh, the division of something conceptually into two opposed or contrasted aspects. No, the same body that I used to dance myself to death at the Red Dog Lounge on Saturday night <laughs> meets that same body meets God on Sunday morning. I can't divorce myself from it. And because of the nature of the, the African-American spirituality and sensuality and the wonderful movement that many African-Americans had, notice I said many because not all, many have a wonderful use of the, of the body. That body praises God on Sunday morning or at any other time as well. So sacred and secular, some people would say, oh, they sin in on Saturday night at the Red Dog Lounge and they praise in God on Sunday morning. God gave us a body and we are to use it to glorify God every day and every gift that God has given us. If it's music and if it's holy gully blues as well as James Cone says, uh, when he was in Bearden, uh, Arkansas, he could hear it. He couldn't go, but he really wanted to go. But as soon as he could listen to it, he did and was greatly moved by it. There is a piece of music that I am going to sing for you. And it comes from uh, Thomas Dorsey. If you know anything about Thomas Dorsey, you know that he was a blues musician uh, before. <clears throat> And after the death of his daughter and his wife uh, in Chicago, he had to get back uh, on the train and go there. And while on the train, a song came to him and his life uh, changed. And that song was Precious Lord, uh, Take My Hand. He wrote music that many of those who were um, the uh, wonderful Christians that they were, uh, decided that was not suitable for church because it had those blue notes in it. It sounded like that old blues that they had in the Red Dog Lounge. How dare he bring this up? But he wrote this wonderful piece of music, and I'm going to sing it for you now. Um, uh, I'm going to live the life I sing about in my song I'm gonna stand for right and always shun the wrong 
I'm not going to go to church on Sunday to ask God's favor. Step out in the street on Monday and not speak to my neighbor. I'm going to live the life I sing about in my song. His music soon took over the African-American church experience and indeed did pour into the American experience uh, as well. They go on to say divisions between intellect and emotion, between spirit and body, in action and contemplation, individual and community. No. For us, the religious uh, is an experience of the whole human person. And we do mean the whole music, uh, the whole human person. The notion that the body is evil is not welcomed by our spirituality, nor embraced in the spiritual life. And within this, <coughs> excuse me, they embraced technology, remembering uh, what uh, time this was. This was in 1984 we certainly did not have the technology that we have today. But they were thinking about the uh, technology and the way in which it made uh, the, uh, the human experience an unreality, that people were, were doing things in such a way that they were not considering their humanness, their humanity as well. They spoke about this and within the context of culture and liturgy and music, the African American experience has tried to always make it personal, personal, personal. And that's why the song continues to say things of I and me and my. I in this experience means we. I is we. It's the whole community. So I'm going to live the life I sing about. And you are singing it the same way. There's something called, um, 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 uh, what do I call that? It's vicarious participation that you, even though you are not singing the piece or playing the piece, you're still experiencing the full impact of the, of the piece because you believe it. And so therefore we can have that vicarious uh, participation. They also talked about um, the gift of joy. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful hallmark of black spirituality. Joy is first of all celebration and celebration is movement and song and rhythm and feeling, color and sensation, exultation and thanksgiving. And we celebrate and proclamate the word of God. There's a song that goes with that. Uh, just making sure that uh, we get a chance to sing, and I'm going to sing it first. Some people may know it already, but you come on in and sing it as well. Uh, um, Got to make sure it's not too high for me. And you. This joy I have. The world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Got those words? Sing with me. This joy I had, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy I had, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy I had, the world didn't give it to me. Yeah, the world didn't give it. The 
the world can't take it away. Yeah, 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 yeah. The world, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. The world, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. And then there was another song where they talked about how sweet the that God is and to know God means that we are not only the holy people of God but that in our holiness God is loving us and remember that song he's sweet I know he's sweet I know Storm clouds may rise, strong winds may blow. I'll tell the world wherever I go that I have found. A savior, oh, and he's sweet. I know, yes. Oh, he, that's too much church now. Oh. We have to go ahead and move on because I need, uh, I have so much that I want to uh, share with you uh, today. These are the uh, bishops who actually wrote the, what we have seen and heard. And you notice that there is a, a little asterisk by, by the ones who have passed. And then we have those who are still with us today. They did an awesome job. Um, it was um, James P. Like, or Archbishop James P. Like, who drove the very first um, African-American Catholic hymnal and named it, as I said, from that uh, passage from John. It is um, a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, to have worked on that. But I want to come to Father Clarence Joseph Rivers, who is thought to be the father, the founder of the African-American musical experience. Uh, Father Rivers was born in Selma, Alabama, and he was a Baptist. His mother, Lorraine, moved him to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he first met St. Joseph Catholic School and was so enamored of it that he decided that he wanted to be baptized Catholic, and he was. He went on to become the very first African-American uh, priest in um, Cincinnati, the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, Ohio. There are a couple of others now, and I do have a picture of one of them uh, as well. This is the second Father Bill Cross, who, by the way, just retired in uh, 2017. He says that he has gone fishing. Uh, <laughs> Father Rivers was an introverted person, but you would never know it. Uh, and because once you met him, you would see a person who came out. Uh, he was uh, very gregarious. But you also did, saw this person who was a priest who um, didn't really look like this. This is a staid picture of him. Imagine him with two ruby earrings in his ear, <laughs> gym shorts, rings on his finger, and Converse high top sneakers. This was Father Rivers. And uh, Converse, by the way, did a, a wonderful thing in that they decided that this man had purchased so many shoes 
uh, from them that they decided that they would begin every time a new color or a new brand uh, came out, they would send him. He had a bedroom of nothing but Converse shoes, which were in precise order as well and in the colors uh, as well. It was an awesome uh, room to behold. I <laughs> said, oh, this is interesting. And the ho and the, but the uh, what he did on uh, in writing a piece of music, it was uh, Father Busemeyer who um, urged him to do something for the life, the religious life, the spiritual life of African Americans at St. Joseph Catholic Church, there in Cincinnati, Ohio, and at his, uh, as at Charles Drive. He asked him to do something, and one of the if not the first piece, the sixth piece that came out of him was the piece that made him uh, the wonderful person that he, uh, that he is. It is based on 1 John 4, uh, 16, and we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. And you know where this is going. We're going to the piece, God is love. We're going to sing that. How many people already know it? Ah, nice. You can lead the holy congregation. Uh, let's see. What key is it in? Da, da. Okay. Let's try it. Let's sing it. God is love, and you abides in love, abides in God, and God in Him. Ah, can we all sing it now? One, two, ready, and one. God is love, and he who abides in love, abides in God, and God in him. Well, the church had never heard a melody like this. We were used to... And we were used to... As well, and we were uh, used to a very, very st structured Lutheran dramatic, uh, Dramaic uh, music, uh, as a matter of fact. And for him to come and place it uh, with these leading chords, they had never heard that before. And in uh, 1964, at the wonderful gathering of the liturgical conference, this piece was used for the very first time. And when it was used, it was used at communion. And it was an experience. It was a moment. Uh, Clarence talked about it often, and uh, uh, my colleague Mary McGann also writes about it and speaks about it often. Because never having heard a piece of music like this before, and this was uh, pre-Ray Rep and Joe Wise uh, as well, um, they were immersed in the piece. They were stunned by the piece, so much so that it went on far too long for communion. And after the uh, service was done, after the benediction, they had to sing it again because the people just kept singing it over and over and over, that refrain. And Father Rivers had to stand there and sing the verses as well. It was a stunning experience. This is the way in which uh, African-American liturgical music made its debut on the stage of the American Catholic Church.
Music, he says, Father Rivers says, must be a top priority for, for, for pastors. If you, the pastor is seeking to create a dynamic African-American worship experience, in his book, uh, Soulful Worship, which is out of print at this point, you may be able to find it in someone's library. I have a couple of copies uh, as well. And uh, someone else has? Uh, I, excellent. Really? Wow. Oh, my. We have history here, living history. Amen. Um, as well, he says this uh, in uh, Soulful Worship. He said, worship is of primary importance for the church. I think I have this as, we're, as well. Worship being the prime. I don't want you reading while I'm reading. <laughs> um, it's like proclamation. You don't want people reading the missalette as you are proclaiming the Holy Scripture. Um, worship is of primary importance for the church, not only for the sake of the church in the narrow sense, but also for the sake of humanity itself. A very necessary ingredient in human progress is what uh, I call a sense of transcendence, a sense of being able to let go to reach out beyond the boundaries and limitations of the here and now. Not because God needs our worship, but because we need it. He spoke about that and when he wrote his book. Father Cyprian Davis had not yet come up with the word ecstasy yet. But in the Catholic liturgical uh, dictionary, for the first time, Father uh, Davis used the term ecstasy as one of the spiritual tenets of African-American spirituality. There is transcendence. And, uh, and what Clarence is getting at and what uh, Father Davis is getting at as well is that you do not enter the church one way and leave the same way. You should have transcended where you were, or have moments of transcendence, so that you have food for the week, or food until the next Mass as well. That's what liturgical celebration should do. When Archbishop Like decided that he was going to, um, the, when Archbishop Like was selected as the next Archbishop of Atlanta, one of the things that he wanted to do was build a center there in the University Center where Spellman and Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse uh, uh, as well, was uh, there. He wanted to build a Catholic center there, and that's what he did. One of the things that uh, was done was that Father Ed Branch asked Clarence to come to Atlanta to open that center. I was lucky enough to be able to be asked to come as, as well. It was a wonderful experience, and this is a gift that Father Rivers gave to the Atlanta uh, Center, and it is of, uh, of the um, uh, lens's depiction of the Lion of Judah in the presence of an African Maasai warrior. A wonderful thing. And that it has much significance, uh, by the way, this, um, the tribe of Judah is often symbolized by a lion. He did, uh, Robert Lenz decided to depict it yet another way. And there are many reasons for the icons that are there in the corners for uh, Christ uh, as well. And if we had time, I would go through them, but I will not today. But I was very, very happy to see uh, when I was in Atlanta in 2015, uh, I went over to the center and there it was, wonderfully 
a, a wonderful uh, uh, homage to Clarence's gift, and that Catholic Center is doing well today. Um, I want to go to uh, a, a, a psalm called... Um, uh, I'm going to go... Ah. You are near. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, the, this, this melody was done by uh, Leon Roberts, another person who has joined the Heavenly Angels. Uh, as well, a wonderful uh, musician and, and a good friend. Uh, you will find Psalm 23 throughout the liturgical year. There, so there are wonderful opportunities to sing it. Um, but I'm not so much interested in the refrain or the antiphon as I am in the uh, text. <coughs> I want to sing that complete text for you uh, this morning to s let you see the possibilities within the African-American spirituality that can take a text and make it alive. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back about doing this. Uh, my ancestors did it first. I want you to know that uh, as well. And what I have done is uh, petitioned them to allow me to be able to, uh, to do uh, the same. So, and we're going to sing this as though we were in church. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. You also hear it where else? Funerals, yes. Ah, I suppose. do a little something different. Um, in San Antonio, I'm sure you, you sing, we've come this far by faith, one way. In Washington, D.C., uh, we sing it another way, adding little notes and everything as well. Uh, and so therefore it becomes regional. And we are at the end of this. I'm doing, there is nothing I shall want. So. We have, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. You sing, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. And let me tell you something that Father Clarence Rivers would tell you. Every human being has a voice. And he would say, no matter how ugly it is, give it back to God. God deserves it. <laughs> and you deserve the privilege of giving it back to God. So don't let me be sitting in here and find a human person who cannot move their mouth in honor of God. I just want you to know that. I ain't going to say nothing else about it. But you know who you is. <laughs> the cantor sings first. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. my shepherd there is nothing I shall want fresh and green are the pastors where he gives me repose 
near restful waters he leads me and revives my aching soul the He guides me along the right path. God is true to his name. Even though I walk through the valley, no evil will I fear. For you are there with your crook and your staff. And with these you give me comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. You have prepared a table before me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed, my head you have anointed with oil, my cup is overflowing, my cup is overflowing, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall one surely goodness and surely mercy will always follow me all of the days all the days of my life and in the Lord's house I shall dwell forever, forever and ever. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord, the Lord, yes, is my shepherd. Oh, there is nothing I shall want. I shall warn. Now, you also noticed that the language here is very different from what we have today. That was done in uh, the book, uh, Lead Me, Guide Me, was done in, in uh, 1987. The language has changed mightily. And I'd like to go to another piece. And this is a piece by a white composer. Let me see if I can find it. No, it's not there. Ah. But you will know the piece. But then I didn't want you reading while I was. And I'm going to ask you uh, not to sing. But it's done by a composer by the name of Shuti. Um, and I always say to African-American musicians, don't neglect the body of music that is there for us. What we can do is take it and transform it to our own spiritual liking. So, listen to this. Lord, you have searched my heart. 
And you know when I sit and when I stand Your hand is upon me Protecting me from death Keeping me from harm Oh, where can I run from your love? You formed me before I was born In the secret of darkness before I saw the sun in my mother's womb, you know my heart and its ways. You who formed me before I was born. I even in the secret of darkness, before I saw the sun in my mother's womb. Oh, marvelous to me are your works. How profound you're something, oh Lord. E even if I could count them, they'd number as the stars. And you would still be, you would still be. You would still be there, Yahweh. I know you are near, standing always at my side. From the foe, and you lead me in ways everlasting. Oh, Yahweh, I know you are always near. Yes, yes. Standing always by my side, you guard me from the foe. I love that piece of music, and it's all, I, I, I think that the genius of the African-American spirituality, African-American sense of culture, allows that piece of music to come into our lives and be transformed, and one can be transformed. So, so when, when Clarence is talking about transcendence, when Father Davis is talking uh, about ecstasy, amidst joy and the communitarian spirit against the holy uh, the holistic sensibility and the joyful sensibility as well that uh, liturgical celebrations can be trans
but there is excellence. And you notice when I got to a certain place in that song, I had to say, and something. Because I totally forgot the words there. And it didn't come out clearly on the piece of paper that I had. <laughs> However, I kept what you always do as ministers is always keep your cool. It was you who made the mistake, not I. <laughs> so, holy people of God, we have sat long enough and we need to uh, be able to take um, uh, a break. And I want to do some more music for you that's, uh, that's more updated, uh, but songs that we sing in the liturgical celebration in the African American Catholic Church and many others as well. Oh, uh, it's called You Are Near by Dan Schutte, S-C-H-U-T-T-E. Uh, it's been on the American scene since the 80s, and uh, that's why I say uh, for Afri African-American musicians, because we're, we're, so, we're so updated and so timely as well, I I'm going to sing another song for you by Dan Schutte as well. I worked with him, by the way, at uh, University of San Francisco. He was the person who was in charge of campus ministry there. And I sang that piece for him, and I sang his other piece as well. And he cried. He said, I didn't know that there were, I didn't know those possibilities were there. So, transformation. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All through the night, all through the night, I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it shine. Yes, all through the night, I'm gonna let it shine. All through the night, yes, and I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Hide it shine, hide it under a bushel, no, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Oh, oh, this little light of mine, yes, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, one more time, and this little light of I'm gonna let it. Yes, this little, I've got to let it. This little light of mine, yes, I'm gonna 
We've experienced some of, the, some of the history, some of the spiritual culture, some of the, the spiritual uh, giants, liturgical giants uh, as well, and some of our leaders. And I wanted to uh, share with you some of the music that we're singing these days in uh, the African American Catholic churches and some other Catholic churches uh, as well. So some of you will know this, uh, know the pieces, and if you do, by all means, please singing, sing them. And I better play it in keys that you can sing it in. Jesus, you're the center of my joy all that's good and perfect comes from you you're the heart of my contentment hope for all I do Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. You're the heart of my content. Hope for all I do. Hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Uh, written by a friend of mine, Richard Smallwood. And here is another piece that was written by another friend, um, William Hurd. We don't often hear his name in conjunction with this piece. But it's simply, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, my heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. That's why my heart is filled with praise. And then there's another piece that we look at and we sing many times on the, the Feast of Christ the King, and that is Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord. 
the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God is wonderful. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. Oh, the Lord our God is wonderful. And listen to this one. Because when I was thinking about it last evening, I said, oh, C-O-G-I-C. Let's see how I can use that. Uh, I, and we sang, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when the Spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart, I'll agree, and the answer be yes, Lord, yes. But I added to it, yes. include everybody and we be singing it in our churches as well there was a lovely lovely piece that was written by another friend uh, M Roger Holland uh, he wrote this piece for communion and he's, he's he wrote just for me you gave your life for me Way back on Calvary, for me, just for me, you gave your life for me, way back on Calvary. Blood was shed for me. You gave your life, you paid the price. You did it all just for me. Just for me. Just for me. lovely piece and he, he also combines that with uh, Andre Crouch's always remember Jesus Jesus always remember and then he went back and found an old piece uh, old gospel piece that was just just marvelous it's a great way to end this piece um, he went back to Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. 
Jesus, I'll never forget. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. Then he went back to your body broken for me. Your blood was shed for me. You gave your life. You paid the price. You did it all just for me. Isn't that a lovely piece? Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that as well. And we can't forget some other old uh, stalwarts, uh, those pieces that have been for uh, been with us for a while. But yes, yet they're somehow always new. Um, uh, uh, remember that song? Um, mm. Mm. Oh Lord, how excellent! How excellent, how excellent, how excellent is thy to go out and it was written by Henry Davis it's attributed to Henry Davis um, and it is a wonderful piece for exit as you go tell the world as you go tell the world tell the world about Jesus Tell them about his love. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love as you go. And we're going to learn this because we're going to sing it when we go out today. So the words are simply, as you go, tell the world. As you go, tell the world. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love as you go. Let's try it. As you go, tell the world, tell the world. As you go, as you go, tell the world, tell the world. And then you have tell the world about Jesus. Tell the world about Jesus. And tell them about, tell them about his love. Tell the world, tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love. Tell them about his love. As you go, tell the world, tell the world. As you go, tell the world. Except we speed it up and it becomes... As you go, 
tell the world as you go tell the world tell the world about Jesus tell them about his love tell the world about Jesus tell them about his love as you go and we clap like this Tell the world as you go. Tell the world. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell him about his love. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell him about his love as you go. Tell the world as you go. Jesus, tell him about his love. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell him about his love as you go. Tell the world as you go. Tell the world. It's a wonderful way to end a celebration. Um, there was a piece written by a person from Chicago, uh, which I love. I am standing on the promises of Jesus. And I believe he will do just what he said. Oh, no more doubts. Or disbelief that caused my faith to decrease all the more. I'll take him at his word. And this song is much too high for me, but I wanted to you to see that the belief. The faith, the the wonderfulness in the uh, and the text of uh, gospel music and music that we use within the context of church. We stand on the promises of Jesus. Very elemental to who we are as Christians, and we believe every word that Jesus said. No more doubt, no more disbelief that ca might cause my faith to decrease anymore, all the more.